Okay. Uh, okay, I'll start right now then. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the 1230 breakout session of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and our web audience, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org and you can post your questions in local chat on the Ustream chat or tweet your comments Or, or tweet your comments on the hashtag OSCC13. This hour, we are happy to enter a terrific panel on the fantastic voyage of converting to open sim for biology and archaeology education. The Virtual Islands for Better Education, called VIBE, is a collaborative of college and K-12 educators and virtual world builders looking to leverage OpenSim for learning activities. What the panel will cover is their experience moving lessons from Second Life to OpenSim, usage by college students for genetics and global health, usage by fourth graders for biodiversity, and construction of massive Creative Commons literature libraries. Our panelists include Max Chatnor, Eva Komorowski, Steve Gassior, Joe Graham, Dragon Lalek, Carolyn Lowe, Lazaron Papadopoulos, Greg Perrier, Martin Smeltzer, Rachel Umoran. Let's all welcome the panel, and we will start with Stephen Zufly. <laughs> Thank you, Delenn. Thank you for moderating, and thank you to the organizers of the OSCC 2013. It's a real great uh, privilege for us to present and have this opportunity to talk about our work. I would like to open with Machinima, made by one of our members, and I'm going to post it into the media screen. And this is a machinima that gives a nice overview of what it would be like to visit our grids. Now, you may need to click on the media screen as it pops up behind us to actually view it. It's about three minutes, so we'll let that play.
Okay, as I have, but people are indicating that it's done. Again, if you didn't have a chance to view the whole thing, please look at the link in local chat. And I'd like to have uh, Bert Matchman in real life, Dragon Lacka, give a quick blurb about the machinima. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, Vibe, for the opportunity to be part of such a great group of virtual world educators and for the opportunity to create the Vibe trailer. Thanks to Isla Sigwe for nominating this video as the finalist of the People's Choice in the Science Show categories at the Sigwe Edu Machine of Fest 2013. And thanks to VWBPE for selecting this video as the second place of the VWBPE 2013 Film and Machinima Award at the 2013 VWBP conference. As a member of VIBE, I would like to present this machinima as the overview of the huge achievement of the virtual world educators. So um, I will actually um, just to have a quick overview of the fathers and sons exploration of the 3D virtual worlds. Uh, but the vibe was the main one which we actually enjoyed. So I will just pass the message to uh, young generations to continue using the virtual worlds and start making the films and machinimas in the virtual worlds. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that's going to be the main uh, points for today's presentation. Is that we're going to talk about an overview of what the vibe grids are about and for, and then let the uh, grid masters talk about their individual experiences with st bringing students through the different grids. So this slide is showing a little bit about my perspective, again, as, as educators, how educational technology can be used to, uh, to do a class. And really at the very base level, it's about delivery. And I have a few exemplars here, different platforms that can be used to, again, present information, chat, videos to, uh, for learning. And then that next level up where you can use flash animations or virtual worlds really has to do with enhancing that educational experience, maybe bringing in field trips or manipulatives that allow the students to engage on their own through different activities to really learn the material more clearly. But it's really only those virtual worlds, those, class, those classes of platforms that allow students to interact, to be present concurrently, that allow you to do things like drive a Mars rover or to cooperate in building, uh, or to visit places like a Holocaust museum where, again, a, sh a quick shout out to the virtual pioneers in Schiff Whitfeld, who had, sorry, Spiff Whitfeld, who had a uh, tour. And that it was really powerful going to the Second Life Holocaust Museum. And if you know anybody out there who's wary about virtual worlds and doesn't know or doesn't feel like they can engage you emotionally, well, then they haven't been to the Holocaust Museum in Second Life. But again, it's this level, the highest level of really getting students' brains and activities and thoughts and personalities engaged in learning that we think are best for bringing in and allowing the students to learn and really truly incorporate information into, into their learning experience. And Second Life, of course, is a wonderful environment, but if you have been in the educational space, uh, there's a lot of momentum against trying to get Second Life used in a lot of different situations. And some of that has to do with perspectives on what Second Life can do. Some of it has to do with the ability to actually control that environment and to control the students in that environment. And so this highest level of being able to perform the instruction, we feel, are these open source virtual worlds, where ultimately you do have complete control over the access, the content, uh, how much you duplicate it. Uh, again, if you are finding that you don't have enough capacity, it's relatively easy to duplicate that because open source and that open license. Now, our main mission is to provide these educational resources that take advantage of that open sim platform because we feel that they provide those immersive learning experiences. I do want to talk a little about the history of our group where we didn't know about OpenSim other than being this vague mythological beast until a land grant uh, call for proposals went out from the Fashion Research Institute. Then that was being done in conjunction with Intel and they were hosting that on a science sim. And that's where we said, well, hey, maybe there's something beyond what we can do to virtual worlds, beyond Second Life, using OpenSim. Now, we moved to our own hypergrid servers, which we maintain and serve, and that these are something that, again, for us to fully provide and control 
is something that we feel uh, having our own server experience and our own servers is really important for that. And again, what I'm going to do at the end of my segment is to just give a quick perspective on what that is like, because that's a relatively uh, rare phenomenon, I think, for the non-technical user. So our grid list right now, and this is just a listing that is uh, something you can view later. I don't want to go through all the details of it right now because these grid masters will be presenting in relatively in order. Uh, the people who are not here, LASPOP, uh, cannot make it. He does pediatric dentistry, has a nice simulation and a grid, uh, as well as Nova Saunders, who's having uh, some personal uh, things to take care of on this weekend. And so uh, those grid masters won't be here. Now, Kira Komarov is a scripting and uh, administrator wizard. And if you have not been to her uh, wiki, was.fm, and looked over the stuff she's doing for OpenSim and Second Life and a variety of other computer-related areas, then you know you're missing out. And a lot of her stuff is basically an open license. And so it's stuff that you can take, is available. She has descriptions of how to implement it, videos, and you really should take a look at that. And her technical expertise has been something that's really been integral to our doing what we've been wanting to do. Again, she does have an attribution license, so please make sure you credit her when that credit is due. Now, Greg Premier, who's a biology educator at Northern Virginia Community College, also cannot be here for technical issues. And he's someone who doesn't have a grid, but is very engaged in using Second Life for his students' instruction. To go through some of the grids in terms of their usage by students, uh, Genome Island, something that a lot of educators are familiar with from Second Life, something that has has been a part of their showcase. Uh, Max has been taking about 35 students per year from Texas Wesleyan through there, which is an underestimate of how many people use it. I was teaching biology classes and would have my students go on field trips to Genome Island. Uh, her OpenSim grid, in, a little bit smaller in terms of prims, but you'll notice it uses four regions. And she had 40 students in uh, one of those regions when it was, was on Science Sim, and she had 40 students in that OpenSim grid uh, this last spring. And she'll talk, I think, a little bit about the ability to spread information out over more area, which, again, has its pluses and advantages in terms of the student experience. The next grid I want to just mention is Biome, something that Carolyn Lowe, uh, Chloe Greenwood in Second Life had up and running in Second Life for several years, bringing many students through from Northern Michigan University. Now, again, you'll notice on the left here, I have a little grayed out region. When I was actually collecting these map tiles, there happened to be an offline region called Fantasyland with a PH nearby genome. And I thought that that having it being offline was just a good visual indicator of what some of our experiences are with Second Life. That, you know, if you can't pay for it, you can't bring certain students in there or people don't like it, then it's just a fantasy land. And it's going to be offline in terms of Second Life. She has Biome as a grid, and that she's had students come through there, including K through 12, much more spread out, uh, and in many ways, a much more controlled and enjoyable experience for many classes of students. Now, because of her experience with some fourth graders, with a collaborator, we've actually completely duplicated that grid and made it Biome for kids. Again, this is a completely separate server instance that was relatively easy to uh, make a copy of the original, and now is something that's a closed system exclusively for the use of fourth graders or K through 12 students uh, in the this summer and the upcoming semesters. Global Health by Rachel Umoran, again Rachel Glow EU in Second Life, is something that she had started in Second Life, and she you'll notice the region on the right. She had 10 students come through that were nursing students and has about 3,700 3, PRIMs, and it's a homestead region, so the number of concurrent users is also relatively small. On the right are her open sim grid with 20-some thousand PRIMs. Again, a lot of those are Linda Kelly-based PRIMs, but there's a region on there which is a specific global health experience where the avatars can go through, interact with essentially bots of villagers to understand various disease outbreaks. And again, you can die in terms of having your health go away in terms of gamification. 
the one thing that we used OpenSim for that grid was while that region was nice having it on there, we actually created a whole separate server instance of a separate traveler grid that only is that one region. And that's something that took very little time and effort because it was easy to duplicate it from the prior creation. And that's something that 70 students have been through so far. And again, there's some plans for that in the upcoming semesters as well. Nova Archaeology. Again, this is something that, uh, again, Nova Saunders, Marion Smelter in real life had at uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And again, that funding went away for that grid. And so now she's been on OpenSim and she's spread her archaeology out. Again, one of the advantages that she has in terms of recreating digs that are going on at her university is that she can take various recreations that are different dig sites and space them out into different regions so that they are more dedicated regions, you're not crowded, and the students can experience them one at a time. Because her, her department's doing a variety of digs around the world, including uh, Belize and some Roman ruins, as well as local ones in Pennsylvania. Now, Project Alexandria, again, something that in terms of Second Life is just impossible. There are server editions that are a part of a creation by Kira Komarov. And that's something that allows you to upload content from the server into prims on the region and then have those be dr drivable by a menu for the various users. And so we've been uploading Creative Commons licensed or basically Creative Commons materials, both images and text, that then are searchable and accessible by individual avatars. And Callion will be giving, Joseph Graham, Callion will be giving a little bit of an overview of that. Okay, so in terms of the transition from uh, to OpenSim from Second Life, there are a lot of things that, in terms of my experience, first when I got started, as well as other Second Life users, that you just don't know about it. And so you aren't going to venture into it unless you have some concrete knowledge of what use, useful features it has. And so here's just a quick listing of some that I think are probably the most important, that whether it just exists at all, the ability to import and export uh, your creations into OpenSim, the wide variety of material that's pre-built out there, and the fact that whatever skill set you develop with the viewer, that all maintains the same. You don't have to learn a whole new platform of, of manipulating an avatar. And the fact that, again, the land is free if you're running your own servers, or again, you can use a, a hosting service that provides land at a cheaper price than Second Life. And I think you know, there's a bit of a marketing and advertising angle that we as a community need to do just on an ongoing basis with people that we know to get them aware of the advantages of OpenSim. And that doesn't mean you have to abandon Second Life, but there are things you can do in OpenSim that you otherwise can't do. And in fact, the panel will probably back me up on this, is that really they were sold on the first, the first four when we talked about some of the transition from Second Life into OpenSim for our group. And again, Greg Premier at Northern Virginia Community College, he hasn't made that transition to OpenSim, and he was going to present today a little bit about some of the barriers that he's in making that transition. But he right now has a system where hundreds of students every semester in his genetics lab are actually using Second Life for their classroom experience. Now, one of the things that I want to address and to talk about very briefly is once one is there, what is that experience like? And I think that this picture kind of reminds me of what that experience has been for me as well as for our grid masters. And again, this is called The Grab by Frederick Glacier, a photographer in the early 1900s. And that trapeze artist, that woman who's in the air, she is presuming that she is not going to fall to the ground. But there is always that moment in time of not knowing how that is going to end up. And again, that's part of the drama of watching the circus. And so acknowledging that OpenSim is, I think, a relatively hardened, although alpha software, that is a community effort. The, there are going to be certain inherent uglies about it that, again, one has to manage or work their way around. And at the point for someone like myself who actually is running the console, running the servers themselves, then for, and for anybody who would want to run one of these, you have to learn how to be comfortable with text command and, and console information. And editing uh, these INI files, which are the 
as you start software, it's really important. You have to be able to do that manually. And again, if you want voice in your grid, that is one manual edit you're going to have to make. In long settings or even just having a formatting issue will break your grid. And so it's, a, <laughs> it's very nerve-wracking anytime you go in there and do that. Uh, creating and managing archives. Again, people talk about how great it is to have archives, to be able to save your information, to upload people's Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, sorry, we had a little bit of uh, internet traffic on the voice. Okay. Uh, let me log back out. Log back in. Okay. Sorry, we had some voice issues. Is that working better now? Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, but these are very daunting tasks, and there's a lot to learn. And in fact, one of the things that we've had to deal, spend quite a bit of time with, is uh, grid bills that just blow up on a grid or crashes. And there's this watchdog that comes up, but we don't know who's watching. You know, and so uh, there's no documentation of what the watchdog is. If you do a Google search for open sim console watchdog, the first pages don't have a description of what that is or the issues related to it. Uh, I keep running into unknown user. This guy is after me all the time. And so these error codes, these oddball glitches, again, sometimes even whole great crashes, that is a barrier to adoption. Okay, I'm hearing we're having some, uh, some technical issues. Let me just say one thing in the, uh, to the other people in the Skype call. Dragon, can you exit the Skype call? And then. All right, how about my voice now? Delenn, are you able to hear all right? Can you speak quickly to see if, how the voice is from you? OK, uh, this is Delenn. We're having a little bit of voice problems with uh, Stephen. Uh, we're working on getting it fixed right now. If anyone has any questions, please ask them in text chat. Okay. I'm almost done, so let me make, a, let me make one more point about that. Okay. All right, so the issue, how's my voice now? Is that working okay for people? I don't hear anything right now. You don't hear anything from me? Oh. I. We're waiting right now for Stephen to come back in. He's having unfortunate troubles with his voice chat right now. Maybe someone else would like to take over and... Uh, do their part of the presentation right now because it's um, almost one o'clock. Okay, I can try that. Uh, are you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Max. 
Good. Okay, let's see if I get my slides on here. Um, While we're in Edison, maybe we could take the question. Okay. Uh, Max, are you talk talking right now? I don't hear you. I'm not. I was trying to get my slides loaded. You're working on the slides right now? Yeah, actually, maybe somebody else should do this. Okay, audience, while we're waiting, uh, does anyone have any questions for Stephen about his part of the presentation? I see Gwinnett has a question. Do any of your friends focus on students learning to create to enhance curriculum? Or maybe she means do any of your grids? Grids. Um, Chloe can talk about that, yeah. Uh, I will do that. Um, let me see if my audio works. If not, I'll. Is my audio okay? I just want to make sure. Oh, good. I have um, been working just primarily to enhance learning. Um, it does make sense to me with my face-to-face my -face classes to use a virtual world if it's not going to make the learning better. It's a tool. And so that's what I've been doing. And uh, with both undergrads, graduate students, and um, K-12 as well. So how would you... Exactly what would you want to know about that? Um, for example, I use um, a point quarter method of for diversity studies, which is something that is used by foresters, and it's great where I live. You can go out in the woods and do it, and I'll be doing that. But if you're teaching in inner city of Chicago, you can't do that. So I created that activity in biome. So that they can have that experience. Um, also, we have yes. Yes, I can hear your voice, Heidi. Uh, Carolyn, are you able to speak right now? Oops, we just lost. We just lost Carolyn. Okay. Can yes, you? Max oh. is talking. Uh, am I still in? Yes. Okay. Well, let me just talk a little bit about. Uh, what I've been doing on um, on the five islands. Oh, it looks like we've got Carolyn kind of spot up.
Yes, what would you like me to do, Heidi? Yes, do you want me to speak right now? Okay, I can hear you, Heidi. Do you want me to hang up and call back? Oh, okay. Yes, you want me to speak? Am I live or just speaking with you guys? I think Dragon. I think can you? Carolyn hear us? is trying to present in text. Yes. I'm back. Hi, Dragon. Can you hear me? Carolyn, are yes, we hear you and we see you on the uh, Skype call. I'm I'm here. Carolyn, yes. I'll take it to you. So do, do you want to uh, stay? The problems that we've had with implementation has been um, with the administration. I have not had any problems with parents, which is interesting. The, um, also I'm opening it up to homeschooled kids, kids and um, online programs, and kids just for fun. So I have some several kids going in there they love to build they love to interact they love to help teachers um, tell them how to build and so it's been really um, beneficial the school who has been using it as part of one of my students thesis um, has moved towards they want to use it for all their grades so the school board is a hundred percent behind it Obviously, um, online schools are going to be interested, and I just met some people whose children are enrolled in an online K-12 school. They're elementary kids, and I think this will be a good venue for them. Obviously, as we get bigger, then we'll have to look at more servers and you know more, more uh, space. Right now, Biome has six islands. Um, I'm using Earth Systems Education as a basis, so I have hydrosphere, biosphere, atmosphere, geosphere, biome, which is the home island, and Kino Miyagi, which is a Native American study island. Biome for kids has the same islands, except it does not have Kino Miyagi. It did a Seaborgia, which is a club island that some kids and I are building. And then Imaginaria, which is an island just for them to build. I had to create that island because we're building everywhere. And um, I have a core where they study uh, those kind of organisms, and there were all kinds of random objects in it. So I had to create a, a place. Kids love to build. One of the projects that was, uh, that my student actually used with her kids, her um, classroom, is we created an environment. We had to create organisms that were adapted by that environment. If you go to biome and you go to um, atmosphere, you can see those organisms. These were 10 to 12 year olds, mostly 10 year olds. So you can see that uh, they were actually exhibiting understanding of adaptation, environment, a lot of ecology concepts. And that's um, her thesis study. So since um, Open Sim versus Second Life, I will not use Second Life again for education. Open Sim solves a whole lot of problems. My biggest problem is moving animals. And if they have good animals, that would be great. But uh, I will not be using uh, Second Life for education anymore. This is working better for my undergraduate students and for kids, obviously. 
So I'm going to leave it at that. And my email is C-L-O-W-E at NMU.edu. It should be up on the slide. Please um, contact me or Chloe Greenwood um, via Biome or Virtual uh, Second Life. And I would be happy to work with you and answer any questions that you might have. Any, I guess I'll pass this on to the next person. Okay, we'll take a break for a second while uh, the next person gets ready. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in text chat. Uh, Rachel is going to be on next. I made it back. Did I start the call? Yes, originally I was on the call. Am I not on the call right now? Do you want me to hang up? Okay. I'm hearing clearly. Okay, I hear you. Yes, I'm back. This is Dylan. This is Stephen. I'm back. back on Hello, the line. can you hear me? Hey, Rachel. Right. Yes. I'm back. Okay, wonderful. Okay. So as I transfer my slides, um, just as a precaution in case I fall out, I'm going to go ahead and post some text chat here about what I'm going to say. But we started looking at the possibilities of, can you hear, can everyone hear me? Okay, wonderful. We started looking at the possibilities of using OpenSIM uh, about a year ago, actually. We had been using Second Life for two years, and we were very limited in terms of some of the things that we could do on Second Life. And so we started looking at OpenSIM as a way of um, eliminating some of those issues. So I think I should have slides coming up momentarily. And as soon as they come up, we'll start going. Okay. So I'd like to give a lot of credit to Eva Komorowski, as uh, Stephen said earlier, she's um, been scripter slash designer um, for one of the projects that I'm going to be talking about, as well as Natalia Ribes, who's been a great source of help on intercultural communication, which is something that we're focusing on, and Jill Helfenstein, who's the director of our interdepartmental global health track. 
So the landscape of U.S. global health programs, and this dates back to 2011, but it was one of the better slides I could find, um, is very broad. Uh, there are a lot of people working in global health right now. And there's a lot of student interest in global health, which means that we need to scramble, at least we have been scramble. global health educators have over the last five to seven years to develop good preparatory experiences and also good measures of students' knowledge. Now, some of the ways that we teach global health are the traditional dreaded lecture, journal clubs, case-based discussions, in-class cultural vignettes are kind of the closest you would get to um, being able to role play or um, do what we do in virtual worlds. Um, but in a simulation, you can really represent a local hospital or village or refugee camp or shantytown, something that you wouldn't be able to do um, without it being prohibitively expensive in real life. Um, students can learn in context. They can interact with users from many different countries. Um, now, in practice, our global health focus has actually been in Eastern Africa. And so... You know, while the broadband penetrance there is getting a little bit better, it's not to the point where we can really say that our students are able to interact with either their colleagues or with members of the local community there. So in practice, what we have been able to do is use um, NPCs and bots, um, and those of you that have been to a few sessions or done a little bit in OpenSim know that NPCs are something that you cannot replicate in Second Life, whereas bots, you can have those. Um, and then bots work equally well in OpenSim, and sometimes actually better because you have more control over how you can link them to external databases. So this shows... Um, one of our regions, it's the Traveler's Activity. And as you can see, it's divided into eight sub-activities. Um, the students are start out at the start, and they followed a, a path all the way through, and each activity builds on the next in order to um, get the students to the final point, which is the Mzungo House. And that's um, another name for white white people <laughs> in Swahili. So the students usually have fun with that. Um, they do interactive tasks, and there are two focuses, um, two main objectives. One is to teach the student about health and disease, and the other is to start the process of teaching intercultural communication. And the second is much more challenging than the first, um, but the second is where we can really use the affordances of open sim. So the students use a health exposure tracker attachment that monitors their health. They're able to get microscopic views of a water sample for disease-causing microorganisms. Um, they need to use the right medication to cure exposures. And there are periodic tests of not through the entire build. Um, with, for intercultural communication, they are able to interact with and obtain information from the NPCs. And so I will finish up with a few pictorial slides of the build. And in the distance, you can see um, a cattle herder. And this particular part of the build is the Maasai herdsman portion where they are um, asked to interact with a Maasai herdsman who is an NPC um, with a Raptor script in him, and so he is able to communicate with them depending on how polite they are to him. His responses are much more um, welcoming, and they are able to get the information that they need. Um, otherwise, he is rather dismissive. This is the village. Um, here, their goal is to 
um, identify the leader, the community leader, who's the chief, and to get permission from him to test the water. Um, they have to figure out where the water source is also. And once they receive that information, they can go to the water source and test the water for disease-causing organisms. And along the way and through this process, um, they are exposed as they go through the sim to various um, endemic diseases that are um, typically encountered in this setting. And, you know, once their avatar is ill, um, they will know that from their exposure tracker and they will start to lose health. So it's a, the goal is to learn about these diseases because they have information from um, their backpack and their note cards, um, but also to stay healthy. And so we find that as they repeat this activity, their health scores go up because they more they show evidence of retention of this knowledge. So they don't they don't get ill either they avoid the exposure or they don't stay ill very long because they're able to quickly treat their condition. So we have a local hospital with patients and Getting to the last slide here, we have the Mazungu House. And the vision of this um, hasn't been fully realized yet because students have kind of just gone through the simulation. But the goal is to have, provide a meeting place for not only debriefing after your simulation, but also regrouping and being able to connect. So I'm going to stop there and let somebody else come in. Yes. I am done. So that was my last slide. Yep. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Rachel. This is Stephen again. And uh, we've run near the end of time, so I'll just make a quick a mention about Project Alexandria and its possibilities. What I've rezzed here in the front of the room is a bookcase that you should be able to take a copy of that has an example of the uh, a literature library of children's stories, something you can take, something that can be created by using the technology of um, Project Alexandria. Uh, I would like to summarize and thank my grid masters for being here and talking about their different grids and to just make one final call that I had at the end of my presentation, which is that for people like myself who are not technically inclined that are at the console, but aren't builders, aren't programmers, that the more people can uh, create tutorials, create clear guidelines for um, other people who are trying to build regions to talk about best practices, the more that those are available, the better for the community as a whole. Uh, we have on the left, I put up a poster. We're going to have grid tours September 17th from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific. And at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions and uh, please put them in local chat. And then I think I mean, our time is up. Okay, thank you. Thanks to our panel for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. In this room, the next session will be at 1.30, Students as Avatar, Pedagogy, Psychology, and Learning by Bill Solomonson. Thank you again to our speakers in the audience. We'll be back shortly with our next session. If you want to talk to Stephen or the other audience members, they will hang around afterwards or be sure to friend them and talk to them later. <laughs>